Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16 begins, This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. Several times over this past winter, I've been able to go snowshoeing up on Mount Spokane. I've had a couple of times where it is normal, it is non-eventful, it's routine. I've had a couple of times where it's been an epic adventure, once where we had a broken snowshoe, and another time where we had to hike out with headlamps in a blizzard. Yet another time, I took a group of 10 total people, eight sophomores, or seven sophomores, and one seventh grader, and myself and another dad. Now, suffice it to say, the eight kids made the dads look foolish when it came to physical health. They were way faster than we were. On the way down the mountain, those eight kids just started going, and the dads were trying to keep up. Well, those eight kids ended up breaking off into two groups, a lead group and a chase group. They came to, uh, the, the lead group came to a T in the trail, a, a crossroads of sorts, and they immediately went right. They just turned and went. Now, by the time the second group of kids caught up to them, the first group was nowhere to be seen. So they stopped. And thankfully, they stopped long enough for myself and the other dad to catch up. When we got to the T in the trail, we looked, we listened, we hollered. A long story short, we all did end up making it back to the car safely. But there was definitely some uncertainty and some fear. Our country, our church, is in a similar place today. Due to the COVID-19 virus, there is a lot of uncertainty, a lot of fear, and we're at a crossroads. We're being told that we can't meet in our regular sized groups, and that's why you're watching me on a video. We're not even sure if we're able to invite friends over to play games. Our normal everyday lives have changed drastically in this last week. So we are stopped and we are looking. Well, the question comes, which direction should we turn at this crossroads? Which way should we take? Thankfully, the passage in Jeremiah at least gives us a starting point. This is what the Lord says, Jeremiah wrote. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. We are stopped. We are looking. So let's ask the Lord which way we should take. Let's pray. Father, as a church, as a country, as a world, um, we are at a standstill. We're not sure exactly the next steps we need to take, but we trust that you are big, we trust that you are good, and we trust that you will show us the right direction. We thank you for that, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we're going to take a one-week break from the sermon series we've been in on Daniel that we've titled, When All Hope Is Not Gone. Next week, Elena will teach on Daniel chapter 12, and then after that, I'll wrap up the series. But for today, we're going to do something different. We're going to do something that's a change, as you can see, because you're watching me on a screen. Today, we're stopping. We're figuring out, where do we go from here? And again, we, we look to Jeremiah for guidance. He says, stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask for the good ways and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. So we're stopping. We're looking. We're asking. Now, when I mention ancient paths, we could go multiple different directions with this, and we could talk about how far back we need to go. Do we just go back far enough to where there's choir robes in a pulpit? I don't think that's far enough back. Do we go back even further into the 1000s where there was bells and smells and routines of the church? I don't think that's far enough back either. Perhaps into the 300s, the 400s, the 500s where there was the desert fathers and the desert mothers who went into isolation in the wilderness. They sought God in silence and solitude. Now, it may feel like we're being forced to live like that, but I say we go back even further. Let's go back to the church that we find in the book of Acts. 
And I'm not trying to glamorize that church. If you read Paul's letters, you know that they had their problems too. But I do think that in looking at them, we'll be able to see some of the ancient paths, some of the good ways that they lived when the church didn't have the social privilege that it has today. So we can look to them and see these ancient and good ways. Now, if you haven't had a chance, grab your Bible. Go ahead and push pause. Grab a Bible and turn to Acts chapter 2. I'm going to read a passage that is familiar to us. Most of you have heard it. You've probably read it. And my guess is you've listened to several sermons on it. So in a sense, today is a review or a reminder. And we all need refreshers every once in a while. So this text comes out of Acts chapter 2, after Jesus had already ascended into heaven. It was after the Holy Spirit had fell on the believers that were gathered together at Pentecost, and it was after Peter had given his speech to the crowds, explaining what was going on. And on that day, it ended up being like a membership Sunday, and 3,000 people joined the church. So we pick up the story right after that, in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. It says, All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to fellowship, and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. They worshipped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. So in this short passage, this well-known passage, we get to see some of the ancient paths, some of the good ways that that early church followed, and all of these ways were about caring for each other. They were about caring for each other, and I mentioned these ways at the kind of the announcements last Sunday, the call to worship, but again, it's worth us being reminded of these ways again. So this early church cared for each other in three practical ways. First, they took care of each other's spiritual needs. Their spiritual needs. You see at the beginning of verse 42, it says the disciples and the believers, excuse me, devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings. They devoted themselves. This means they didn't just sit and listen to a talking head on a screen and then check off the I went to church box. No, they listened to the teaching. They chewed on it. They wrestled with it. They discussed it. I'm sure they talked about ways they could actually live out what they were learning from the apostles as they taught. They devoted themselves to the teaching. Now that's the beginning of verse 42. At the end of verse 42, it says they also devoted themselves to prayer. Now, I'm sure this prayer was more than just, Dear God, thank you that I woke up today. I'm sure this prayer was purposeful thoughtful, intentional, focused time talking to God and listening to God. I'm sure they had prayers where they prayed by themselves, but also when they prayed in groups. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, they devoted themselves to prayer, and they also took care of each other's spiritual needs by worshiping together. Verse 46 says they went to the temple to worship together daily. Now, perhaps this temple worship included hearing scripture read out loud. Maybe it had responsive readings. Maybe it included singing the Psalms, which was the equivalent of the Jewish hymn book. I mean, at the beginning of verse 47, it says the believers were doing all of this while praising God. The bottom line is they were figuring out how to live their lives as lives of worship together every day. And in doing so, they were caring for each other's needs. Now, fast forward to today. We can't meet in large groups together. So what does worship, what does prayer, what does devoting ourselves to teaching look like for us today? Well, it could be something as simple as watching this video 
and then talking about it with your family or with friends. I'll ask some questions at the end that you can discuss together. It could mean calling somebody who does not do computers, who's not technologically savvy, and reading them the daily devotions that have been sent out this week. It could be texting a short note to somebody saying, hey, I'm praying for you. Or better yet, texting your prayer to them. Maybe the worship looks like sharing a YouTube link. I know Tim gave us three links for worship songs that we would have sang today. Maybe you use one of those. Or maybe there's been another song that's been filling you up lately, helping bring peace and calm in the midst of the chaos of life. Share those links. These are all ways that we could look for the ancient paths, the good ways, as we care for each other's spiritual needs. Now the next part in this passage in Acts that people were caring for each other is they were caring for each other's emotional needs. Their emotional needs. You see in verse 42 that it says the, the, the believers devoted themselves to fellowship. To fellowship. The Greek word there is koinonia, and it means partnership. It means sharing together. It means doing things in the community. Now, whatever that looked like specifically, we know that they were doing this with joy and generosity. It says that at the end of verse 46. In fact, we do get a little look at what koinonia looked like with that second half of verse 46. It looked like table fellowship. It looked like time around meals together. The, the passage says, and they shared their meals with great joy and generosity. Sharing meals, of course, was also mentioned in verse 42. Table fellowship. To sit around a table with someone. To laugh. To share the joys of the day. To share the highs and the lows together. This is what I believe they were doing around their table. And when they did that, I fully believe it was doing wonders for their souls. Because when you eat a meal together, you feel welcomed. You feel included. You feel loved. You feel valued. You feel like family. And that is what fellowship is all about. So the early church was caring for each other's emotional needs in that way. Now what could that look like for us? with our current COVID-19 situation? Well, many different options. You could send a card or an email just telling someone how much you appreciate them. You could make a phone call and ask somebody how their day went and then listen, genuinely listen. Ask them what has made them smile. Ask them about the challenges they're facing. Ask them about the fears that they're feeling. Maybe you do this on the phone or maybe Here's a novel idea. You invite them over for dinner. So far, the government has not told us we can't have company. So you could invite somebody over to your house, share a meal together, or if you don't want to eat together, sit on opposite sides of the living room and watch a movie. Now, I'm sure you've got other ideas. But these are all ways we could look for the ancient paths, the good ways by caring for each other's emotional needs. Now, one more thing, one final good way we can glean from this passage in Acts of ways we can care for each other. And that's that we should care for each other's physical needs. Our physical needs. Part of the way the early church did this was by sharing meals together, which we just talked about. But you can also see this caring for physical needs very specifically at the end of verse 44 and end of verse 45, where the text says they shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. Wow, this is caring for each other's needs, their physical needs, no doubt about it. I mean, so many of these new believers had come to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost when they found out about Jesus and began following him and kept sticking around to learn more and more about what it would mean to live their lives following Christ. So they came as guests into Jerusalem but the longer they stayed, the more their supplies would have run out. So the new church stepped up and continued to step up, making sure that everyone had everything they needed. And this was caring for each other's physical needs. And again, the question can get asked, what would that look like for us today? And the possibilities really are endless. I'm sure you've heard these already in the last week to two weeks on the news and on, on Facebook and social media. 
But you could get a grocery list from someone who can't make it to the store and then go and get their groceries for them. You could make a call and say to somebody, how can I help? No, really, I mean it. How can I help? You could double check with somebody and make sure they have all the medications they need in case they can't get to the pharmacy. If we're talking about physical health, go on a walk with someone. Get out in the fresh air and get away from the screens that are constantly changing and that can be very intimidating and scary. Getting away from it all can do wonders for your stress levels. This is all part of taking each care of each other's physical needs. And this is all part of ways that we can today put into practice some of these ancient paths, some of these good ways that we're seeing in the early church. Caring for each other spiritually, emotionally, physically. But listen, don't just stop at caring for each other here in the church. Don't just stop at caring for your other Christian friends. Go find somebody who you know who doesn't know Jesus and do these same things that we're talking about. Because your actions may be the loudest Bible they will ever read. Your actions may be the best evangelism, the clearest bit of evangelism they will ever hear. I mean, you look at the end of our passage in Acts, and it says, And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Man, imagine what would happen if in the, the, the chaos, the turmoil, the unrest that our, that our world is going through right now, imagine if God used our purposeful way of living and caring for each other to add to the numbers of his family. Imagine what the fellowship could look like after all this takes place. I tell you what, I want to walk down that path a ways. Would you join me? This is what the Lord says, Jeremiah wrote. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient ways. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. I love the challenge at the end that Jeremiah gives. He says, don't just stand. Don't just look. Don't just ask. When you've done all those things, go and do. Walk in it, he says. Actually go and do the things that we're finding as we look back at the church in Acts. Jeremiah says that God says when we do that, we will find rest for our souls. And I tell you what, in the days we're living in right now, finding rest for our weary souls will be greatly welcomed. Hear it again one more time. Jeremiah 6, 16. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it. And you will find rest for your souls. So what next? I like to ask that question at the end of every sermon. What do we do with this? Well, how about this? When you're done watching this video in just a few moments, grab a piece of paper. Make three columns on it and write these words, spiritual, emotional, and physical. And then think through ways you can practically address these needs in each of these, in each of these columns for the people you know, both those in the church and outside of the church. So write these things down and then call somebody. Talk to them about what you're writing down. Ask them what they are writing down. And then after that, now hold on to your hat. After that, pick one of the things that you have written down in one of the columns and go and do it. In the words of Jeremiah, go and walk in it. Pick one thing per day this coming week and see how much you and God can get done this week. Because as you do, I'm confident that God will give your soul rest. Doesn't that sound good? I'm looking forward to hearing from you to seeing you, and to being on this wild adventure together. Let's pray. Father, we're trusting you as leader. We're trusting you as guide. We're trusting you to show us the direction. We have stopped. We have stood. We have looked. We have asked. We have discerned what one of your texts tells us to do. 
to care for each other's needs, spiritually, emotionally, physically, and Lord, with your help, with your Spirit's help, we want to put into practice these things. And as we do them, we pray that you would bless our efforts. May our efforts point people to a God who is in control, to a God who knows all and loves all. We look forward to seeing what you're going to do in and through us this week, Heavenly Father. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.